Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's session on the accessible information regulations and the support grant that's available. I'm Tim Rivett and I run an organisation called Artig, um, and we've been working very closely with the Department of Transport on the development of the guidance around the regulations and uh, are administrating the grant on the Department of Transport's uh, behalf. So we are recording this um, and I'll circulate around a copy of the recording and the slides afterwards uh, so you can share it with people that can't be uh, with us this, this afternoon and, uh, and review what was said uh, later. Uh, we're going to have a quick look at the regulations um, and why they've been introduced. Uh, have a look at some Welsh specific implementation issues. Um, and uh, I invited Mark Jones along from Transport for Wales, who's got some uh, useful experience in this area of the work he's been doing recently. Um, and then we'll have a look at the support that's available in terms of the grant and other information. And uh, whilst we'll have Q&A at the end, uh, there's a couple of points that I'll open it up as well. And uh, do feel free to use the chat as we go along. It might be useful to help remember what questions you've got as we go. So why are the regulations being introduced? Uh, if you've ever tried to make a bus journey in an area that you're not familiar with, uh, particularly if it's uh, dark and uh, wet and all the windows are fogged up and things like that, it's very hard to know uh, where you need to get off. That increases the levels of anxiety. Now, if you take away some of your senses, you know, if you have a visual impairment, if you've got a hearing impairment or a learning and cognitive challenge, then uh, that just increases the uh, anxiety levels. Um, back in 2014, uh, guide dogs for the blind did a survey and over 70 percent of their respondents and members uh, had missed a stop because a driver forgot to tell them when to get off. Now, drivers are busy people. They're sensibly there to drive. So it's not surprising that uh, they're going to uh, forget on occasions, particularly when it's busy. Um, and so uh, uh, these regulations provide some technology to, uh, to help. Um, and people with disabilities are known to make significantly fewer journeys of any sort than uh, than uh, others and so anything that helps uh, narrow that gap and increase the uh, ability to travel is a good thing. Um, the need for audiovisual information was identified um, many years ago and uh, as far back as 20 years ago there were various trials and pilots and, and small implementations but 15 years ago Transport for London uh, completed their rollout of audiovisual on buses. Um, and so if you've been down to uh, London any time in the last 15 years, you'll have come across it. Um, if you've been on new rail rolling stock in the last um, 20 odd year, 25 plus years, then you will have seen and heard audiovisual information on that rolling stock. So it's not new, it's quite well understood as a technology and principles. Um, then um, because of that um, and the rate of rollout of it on buses, uh, Department of Transport identified that there was a need to regulate to uh, ensure that uh, all buses had it and the experience for passengers was consistent. So in Wales, um, at the end of 23, 37% uh, of buses had some form of audiovisual equipment installed. Um, much better than, uh, than, than England has to be said. So uh, you're doing well, but uh, still that uh, means that nearly two thirds of vehicles didn't have anything. 
So what do the regulations require? They need uh, almost every local bus or coach service to provide audio announcements and visual information, uh, information about route, the stops and uh, some other stuff like diversions. And we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail as we go through. Um, their regulations apply to um, buses and coaches operating local bus services. There are a few exemptions which we'll have a look at next, but um, if you're operating a local bus service, it doesn't necessarily have to be registered with the traffic commissioner. Uh, so, for example, uh, rail replacement comes under definition of local bus service under various transport acts uh, where the requirements for local bus service are met. So uh, stop points of less than 15 miles uh, as the crow flies. So, you know, if you're going from one end of the country to the to the other without any stops, then um, that's not in scope. But if you've got a local branch line service that's uh, running rail replacement, then you probably are in scope. There are, as I've said, a number of exemptions. So small vehicles, less than 17 passengers are exempt. Heritage vehicles that are more than 50 years old, um, operating excursions and tours, um, and um, home to school services that are closed. If they're open door service, so you let uh, Joe Public on as well as uh, kids, then uh, they are in scope. But if it's closed door uh, and you know who's going from A to B, then uh, that's out of scope. Um, where you've got demand responsive sections, either whole route or sections, uh, flexible service, whatever you want to call them, then they're out of scope. Uh, and uh, where you've got existing community bus service running under section 22 then they're out of scope as well but if you've got some new vehicles uh, under section 22 then they are in scope the regulations are being rolled out on a phased basis uh, on the age of the vehicle um, and uh, it's when the vehicle was first used for local public service that matters. You might have acquired a vehicle from another operator. It's not when you first use it. It's when that vehicle was first used on local uh, bus service. So you might need to do some digging if you don't know uh, or haven't got an idea about when that was. So if you've got new vehicles being delivered for first use after October this year, it needs to be installed and equipped. Um, so that might mean if you've got vehicles in uh, manufacturer backlog then you placed the order a couple of years ago, like some operators, they're having to uh, review the, uh, the specification that they're expecting to be delivered. Um, if it's a vehicle that's five years old uh, in October, then you need to have the vehicles equipped from October this year. Um, and if you've got 50 year old vehicles, you've got until October 2026. But that's only two years ago way. And there's a lot of vehicles in the uh, fleet that need fitting. Uh, and there are some resource constraints to rate of fitting at the moment. So uh, don't think you can uh, put it off for a couple of years. So 37% um, of vehicles in Wales last year had some form of audiovisual already. Um, therefore, you may be eligible for partial compliance. So this would be where you have existing equipment that was installed before October last year, and you've got evidence that that was installed before last year, and you don't meet quite all of the detail of the regulations. So you might not uh, do some of the alerts or you might not have hearing loops installed. Uh, you have uh, a uh, benefit of not having to fully comply with the regulations until October 2031. But if kit on that vehicle breaks and you need to replace things, 
then whatever you replace it with needs to be uh, fully compliant. Um, but if you've got existing kit, uh, then uh, you might well be able to uh, have that on board using the partially compliant uh, exemption. So what do you need to do? You need to provide audio information and you need to make sure that that covers um, in an intelligible way at least 51% of seated passengers on both decks. Um, if it's a decker um, and the way that the regulations define that is uh, a technical um, way of doing it. Uh, so it's got to be at least three decibels over the background noise. Um, and the recommendation is that that's tested uh, at stationary five miles an hour and 20 miles an hour um, to pick up, you know, older diesel vehicles going up hills and things like that. Um, and there's a maximum level of 84 decibels. Uh, where does that come from? Well, that comes from health and safety legislation. You shouldn't be exposing people on a regular basis to uh, noise over that without having to provide them with some form of hearing protection. So you don't want drivers having to have uh, hearing protectors on and things like that. As well as audio, you need to provide the uh, the content for that coming over an induction loop. So you might well have seen hearing loops, induction loops in use in banks and building societies, council buildings and things like that. Um, symbolised by a, uh, a blue symbol with an ear and a T. Um, the T um, is the T switch that quite a lot of hearing aids have. Um, that means that rather than using a microphone, it picks it up um, on a loop and feeds it directly into the hearing aid. And so background noise and things like that just disappears. So uh, it means audio is much more intelligible. You need to provide that loop system um, in the priority and wheelchair space areas of the vehicle um, and you need to sign it. As well as audio, you need to provide visual information, so some form of display. Um, the regulations are technology agnostic, so you can choose whatever sort of display you want. Um, again, that's got to be visible to 51% of seated passengers. Um, you don't have to worry about um, the visibility to seated passengers if you've got a full bus with standers. Um, and, you know, clearly you, you can't do too much about that. So 51% of seated passengers, unimpeded view of the display. So no handrails in the way and things like that. Uh, and there are various requirements from things like the minimum character height, um, which is actually pretty small. Um, all the way to things like not using uh, all capitals because that means that it's harder to read for uh, people with uh, with some impairments. Um, where you have a new vehicle from October this year and you've got a rear facing wheelchair bay, uh, you need to consider how that user is going to see the visual content that almost certainly means you need to install an additional display that's forward facing for them to use um, and so uh, you don't have to retrofit that's one of the common misconceptions uh, some operators are retrofitting uh, a forward facing display but you don't have to it's only a requirement for new vehicles the information that you need to provide, you need to provide route information. Um, so uh, name the number of the bus, uh, where it's going, or if it's a clock, what you know, if it's a circular service, which way around the loop it's going, for example. Um, and you need to alert passengers when it's getting to the end of the last uh, end of the route at the last stop. Wake them up with some form of alert and tell them to get off. Um, as you're progressing along the route, you need to uh, provide information about the next stop, whether or not you're stopping there. Um, and that should be done in a way that gives enough time for somebody to go, aha, that's the stop I want. Press the button and the driver not have to do an emergency stop. 
um, and so you might need to think about the timing of that um, in areas where you're going at speed or particularly coming out of urban areas you know you might be going through residential areas with with stops every uh, you know few hundred meters going at 20 mile an hour um, that's not a lot of time to make announcements um, conversely if you're on a rural route you might have stops every two or three miles in a village uh, in in you know in the middle of villages you don't want to be making an announcement for the next stop um, just as you leave the last one and it's two or three miles until the next stop because you don't want passengers getting up standing up going to the front of the bus you know and they might be there for two or three minutes going around twists and turns so think about when the best time for those announcements are made and the name that you use needs to be consistent with other information that that passenger might have got if they've planned a journey you know used an online journey planner or an app printed information the name that's used needs to match uh, and so passengers have some uh, you know uh, have some confidence that it's the right stop um, and so uh, you know recognize that stop names sometimes are have different views depending on who you are different operators want them called different things authorities want them called something else so uh, there might need to be some negotiation over that um, now there are some other detail which we'll come on to but mark from transport for wales has to go uh, fairly soon and so i thought i'd pop to um some of the Welsh specific issues that you might have before we cover those. So Welsh Language Act, I understand, applies. So you are going to have to do dual language announcements. A um, couple of challenges. One is the source of stop names. Um, another one is um, not many of the uh, systems that use text-to-speech engines where it'll take some text and do the announcement uh, in audio automatically support Welsh and so you're probably going to have to pre-record those names and use a system that uses pre-recording which needs a bit more planning when you've got changes and things like that and clearly if you've got dual language announcements you're going to need to think more uh, about when those announcements are made um, but Mark I don't know whether you've got any advice on the source of stop names from the work that you've been doing uh, yep I can elaborate a little bit so we're working on the uh, as mentioned the Welsh Bus Data Service which is taking data from the uh, real time and the timetable from Travel Line Cymru to provide um, Ultimately, for the local authorities where you've got a display, a roadside display, a, a real time uh, message uh, around the uh, predictions. And for that to work, for that to drive the information, we link to the uh, NAPTAN code. So for every stop, there is a, a record, um, a UK record for every stop. So it's got a code and it's got a English description. But what we're trying to do is make sure that we've got a Welsh uh, equivalent stop name and working with either Travel Line Cymru, now part of TFW, or the local authorities to get that information. So historically, that data hasn't been available. There hasn't been a field in the UK standard to support Welsh. So we've been um, using an alternative field to update the system so that we've got that record available. So as and when you come to do this, um, we will have a Welsh equivalent stop name available for the um, for the display. And I've, I'm not sure how it's going to work for the audio side of things, but for the display, we can supply the the stop name. Um, and you thought we had a massive issue um, with dual language, because when you have an urban environment, the time you've said the stop in English in Welsh or Welsh in English, your four stops down the line. And it caused a massive issue with customers and we had to then switch off the dual language. Um, 
and we have tried various things like shortening the stop names, etc. Then you've got people get confused about historic names of certain stops. How do you intend to get around that in Wales? Richard, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on the application. I mean, this this is a UK bit of legislation. Um, I've, and... I'm, I've spoken with Robert, of course, in DFT and I've raised our concerns because at the end of the day, you know, we, we can't not include the Welsh language. It's a condition of BSSG for a start. And we've got Cymraeg 2050, which we need to be considering to make sure that the Welsh... I get Scott's point. You know, you've got bus stops maybe every lamppost. You've got to make sure that that information provides something meaningful. You know, Tesco will be the same in Welsh and English. Morrison's the same. But there are places like pub names. You know, I, I live not far from Porthmadog. You know, you've, you've got a pub here. Um, Sportsman in English at Hellior in Welsh. So there's two different kind of names for it. And by the time you've gone through that pronunciation, depending on the speed, the traffic, you're on to the next stop. So we really need to be finding a way, working with industry here in Wales, to make sure we are able to maintain the Welsh language element. But then equally then that we do kind of, you know, match and we, we meet with the regulations coming through. <clears throat> but, you know, it, it's got to include Welsh and it's got to be understandable because otherwise it's going to confuse things for the passengers and it's going to put more pressure on the bus driver out there trying to do a job. So it's just making sure that we're with every consequence that we understand that we mitigate the risk around the unintended consequences which are created. So <clears throat> I'm more than happy, Tim, as I've mentioned, to, um, as I've mentioned to, to Robert in DFT, you know, more than happy to set up some kind of a working group here in Wales, which involves the operators and the LAs, so that we can actually look at these specific things and report back to DFT. It's not devolved, of course, to us in Wales, as you quite rightly said, it's a UK government led regulation. But it's got to work. It has to work in Wales and it's got to take into account the Welsh language. And um, for those not on the call who don't know me, I, I'm Richard Jones, by the way, I work for Welsh government. So I've been working quite closely with um, Daniel Wright, who was in post previously, and, and of course, Robert was dealing with this. But we've got to get it right in Wales. You know, we, 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 we can't expect anything less. Mm -hmm. And just to flag up then, Richard, at the start, that this is a major issue that uh, ZMD at Newport when it was, we, did, we rolled this out and it was a major, major problem. You also had the issue around it being Newport and very few Welsh speakers, you got customer complaints. I know it's got to go in and understand why, and dare I say, and against it being a, a Scotsman in Wales. Um, so it's, it's very good to be carefully. Another question was for TFW, if I may. Um, we've had historic problems with NAPTAN across Wales. Are you now saying that NAPTAN stops are all done and they're all right? No, not at all. They are... Uh... Um, still uh, in the local authorities are um, working with us to update the NAPTAN. So there's, there's two issues, I think, with NAPTAN. One, location. There's a lot of locations of NAPTAN that are completely in the wrong place. And we're using technology now to try and w identify which stops are in the wrong place um, rather than even going out. But again, if there's operators that can help with that process, that, that'll be really good. Um, and secondly, yeah, the naming of stops as well. Um, there's some only recently have been changed from quick save and historic names that no longer exist. Um, and Welsh language, which is for me the most important to make sure that's got some uh, record against it as well, because that's not existed at all. So coming at it from lots of different angles, but data quality is a real concern and, and needs to be addressed um, for us as we're working on the displays, but for this project as well. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um. Just to pick up the 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 challenge of the length of name. Um. There are some places in England where the stop names are, have been quite long, and the distance between stops has been very short. And operators that have got existing systems have overcome that, and it's been accepted by the department that in some circumstances just announcing the name of the road 
um, easy enough rather than each stop. So where you've got, you know, stops very close together, as long as customers have a decent idea about where they are, that's what this act is tr regulations trying to um, address. And so, you know, in those sort of circumstances, a pragmatic approach can be taken. I mean, you've got a bit more of a systemic problem with uh, with the length of, of, of names, but, you know, that has been accepted in, in some situations in England. Well, is, um, it, is it then same an opportunity that, you know, proactively we, we work with our valuable bus operators and coach operators here in Wales and equally, you know, with the LAs? So that we come up with some kind of you know, a common approach to it, because um, we could end up quite easily with with you know, slightly different approaches in different parts of Wales. We need that common approach, but we need something that's you know, practical and 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 you know, it can be delivered by by the operators. There's enough pressure, of course, on bus operators as it is, um, and I know that the operators are very keen to make sure that this works. But we've mm. just got to get it right. So I'm I'm very keen, Scott. I know as the chair of Quebec and I know who's on from CPT. I think Ian's on the call from CPT. Um, more than happy just to sit down. We can involve you, yeah, Tim, yeah. get DFT mm. involved and we can progress through it because we, we've done something similar with PSVAR. So, Scott, I'm here to help, OK? Yeah, I'm happy to have you get involved, Richard, and I'm happy to, to advise the, the trials of Newport Transport yeah. because we did try to resolve it because it was a massive, it is seen as a massive benefit. I get that, um, but we've had to, they have had to um, move back to English only. Um, but there is a, the, the solution simply is you either do the road name or you do the area name, or you do something similar to, when we start looking at actually changing names of stops, then it becomes historic, a massive problem for people who always recognize they stop as being the white horse or the, Mm. The pub in the corner type of thing. So you've got a challenge there on your hands. But it's not to say it's not insurmountable, but I'm happy to to speak to the team at Newport Transport, these guys, to talk to TFW to say, look, here's what we've tried and it's failed to save you guys some time, basically. I, I hate to use the comment lessons learned because it comes up quite often to moments in different places. But I'm sure there are lessons, as you say, Scott, you've been there, you've done it. We can learn from you know, people like yourselves who have already been doing things like this to see you know how, how can we do it in other places so yeah more than happy i think if i have a discussion tim offline mm. and we all have a discussion with robert in dft so yeah. we can make sure that we're elevating i've already elevated the point about you know duality of course you know the bilingualism of of the welsh language and the importance of it in wales so let's let's work together to try and get it uh, get it right yeah yeah no, that'll be fine. Um, Mark, before you disappear, is there anything else you want to add or get across about the work you're doing with the data service? Um, not on this call, probably, but I'd, I'd like to catch up with the operators to talk about the work we've been doing. Uh, I'll maybe arrange that via Richard. Yeah, no problem at all, Mark. Uh, but thanks. I, I, having dealt with Naptan in my previous kind of working life in the local authority, yeah, I can feel your pain. So yeah, you know, we're we're all here to help, Mark. We're we're all here trying to make the the, the yeah you know, we're trying to reach the same outcomes, aren't we? At the end of the day. So thanks, Mark. Cheers. Deal. Okay, so uh, if we take a step back, we talked about stop points, and that's where we got to Welsh language stuff. Um, where you've got sections of route that are hail and ride, you clearly don't have bus stops. Um, and so uh, how do you let people know where you are? So the requirement is that you provide an alert that you're about to start a hail and ride section and you're ending it. Um, that's the minimum requirement. Um, the recommendation uh, is that where you've got a lengthy stretch, you provide some additional contextual information. So that might be, you know, we're going through a particular village or we're just, you know, coming up to some crossroads or something like that to help people on those longer stretch and sections have some, you know, concept of, of where they are and therefore where they might want to work to request to get off. Um, 
You also need to provide information about diversions. Um, so there's two elements to this, I think. One is the um, planned diversions. So if you know there's a diversion off your normal route for a period of time, uh, at the moment you might go, oh, there's a, you know, we've got a diversion in this area for six months and we'll update traffic commissioner and, and update data and journey planners and things like that. Um, and you might not bother for, you know, ones that are in place for you know, a month or a couple of weeks. Um, you might want to rethink that approach um, in light of this because you can reprogram the system and it will you know, know where it's going and things like that. And that means you don't need to get the driver involved in the requirement that you're going to have to come across on on some basis you know you come around a corner and uh the police have closed the road for whatever reason or there's some emergency road works and you've got a diversion you know you don't know about it before you hit it um and so the requirement the minimum requirement is that the driver has some way of triggering an announcement to say uh, the bus is going on diversion um so you know that is something for the driver to do because systems aren't going to be able to know about that in advance and so you know given that they've got enough to do uh, as it is reprogramming where you know about a diversion that's going to be in place for a while you probably want to think about you know keeping things a bit more up to date than perhaps you might have done historically um, with these audio visual systems um, it's not just a case of um fitting and forgetting um because you do need to keep routes up to date if you just change your timetable and the times you don't need to do anything but if you're changing the route you obviously need to reprogram so that the right stops are uh presented in the right order um you need to make sure the kit's working the regulations require you to have it working um and fixed pretty quickly um, and so you're going to need some form of regular check to make sure it's working. Now, it's quite easy to uh, check whether the audio announcements are working. The driver's probably going to notice the world's gone quiet if it's not. Um, it's quite easy to have a quick look at a display to see whether it's showing something. Uh, it's a bit harder to test the hearing loop. Some of the hearing loop systems that are available have got remote monitoring, so you might find out in the back office, or they've got LEDs that you can see when there's a fault and things like that. But even in those cases where you've got kit that's got that, what that can't tell you is whether actually what's coming through the loop is intelligible or not. And so uh, the recommendation is that you uh, get hold of uh, a uh, a little receiver less than 100 quid um, you plug a pair of headphones in and it acts as though it's a hearing loop with a t-switch and so you can hear what's coming through the loop now you're not going to need to test that every day but perhaps might want to do it once a week once a month whenever you're doing a more thorough vehicle check perhaps um, the other thing to think about um, as Scott was uh, alluding to, passengers are going to be quite um, upfront where they identify stop names that are wrong or you've missed out this stop out of the off the display. Um, and so think about the process that you're going to have for when you do get passenger comments. You know, how does the driver record that to make sure it gets passed back? Uh, and looked at how does the driver themselves report issues and things like that and how do you get back to the passengers so think about that feedback uh, and uh, and reporting process so that's a quick run through the regulations has anybody got any questions about those before we get on to the grant and support I think if I can just add into it, having been a bus operator myself and having worked for a local authority and I've still got my bus license next to my desk here, it, there's a lot of moving parts in all this. 
a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of responsibility on the operator in terms of making sure that the staff out on the road remember you know all all of this that comes the driver's got a lot of responsibility as it is but then having kind of you know trigger points diversions particular operator i run you know we were quite susceptible to you know road traffic collisions in summer and frequently we would need to divert um so i think it, it it's just working through I'm sure you'll come to it at some point in terms of guidance and available information online to support. Um, but I think it's just very important that we give our operators as much support as we can in helping them to to to, to deal with this. Mm. Yeah, I mean that that that's why I highlighted diversion information and the mm. fact that actually, you know, if it's planned, you might want to think about you know updating your your you know your your data to the TC and, and online because that means that the driver doesn't have to remember to press the button that says, you know, the bus is going on diversion, reducing that overhead on them. Um, you can't, you know, overcome that for every incident if you've got, you know, traffic collisions and things like that, but you can minimise it um, where something's planned. I, I think you're coming to it next, but there's a cost implication, isn't there? There's the cost of setting it up. But then there's a non-cost in making sure that the system remains you know, workable. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why the grant exists, uh, which is next. If nobody else has got any questions or comments on the regulation. If anybody has any questions, just please shout out. Um, be lucky to get Tim to, to give us this presentation today or even Tim if somebody it's always the case isn't it? I'm the same I'll think of something after the event yeah if there are any more questions and if we work closely with our trade organizations Quebec and CPT if there are any further questions you happy if they forward them to me and we forward them to you absolutely or direct um or direct, contact you know, details are, still. yeah 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 contact details are on the last slide which we'll share and so uh, yeah yeah oh, better yeah. still then so with Ian on the call of course from CPT and Colin mm. and Scott from Quebec um mm. please please make use of Tim's contact details at the end yeah thanks Tim so um moving on um whenever a regulation or law is introduced there's a requirement on the department doing it to carry out an impact assessment to look at what the costs are uh, for different organizations or individuals uh, and where the benefits are um, and um, one of the um, one of the um, things that was identified during that impact assessment process was that there is a disproportionate cost to small operators um, with the introduction of these regulations. Uh, if you've got 100 vehicles and you knock on a supplier's door, they're probably going to give you a discount over if you've got a single vehicle. Um, likewise, uh, if you need some tool to uh, manage the data, um, then that tool you can you you know you need that if you've got one vehicle or a hundred vehicles and so there is a uh, disproportionate cost to small operators and so to help mitigate that they uh, found from treasury um, after a bit of persuasion uh, four and a half million pounds to help small operators uh, with these costs um, and because of the relationship that we've built up with the department uh, over the years particularly on this um, these regulations they have asked Artig to manage the grant on their behalf um, and so um, that's what I want to talk to you about now so when we talk about small operators uh, we're talking about 20 or fewer in scope vehicles so you might have 25 vehicles but eight of those are minibuses and so out of scope. So don't think of that necessarily as a, oh, I've got 25 vehicles, therefore I'm not eligible. It's where those vehicles could be in the scope of the regs. Um, you can't be part of a larger group 
um, because then you're almost certainly going to have more than 20 vehicles in the group. Um, it, it, the vehicles have got to be in scope, so you know they've got to be 17 seats or more. They've got to be usable on a local bus service and meet those requirements. Uh, and uh, you don't have any form of audio visual already. Um, applications are from direct from operators themselves. Um, if you've applied for some forms of um, government, local or national um, funding, sometimes you have to get um, you know lots of documentation, right? War and peace, and and you you know quite often you. Uh, might need to get consultants involved in things like that. Um, we have tried to make this as simple as possible. Um, the most you might need to do is knock on the door of your accountant to ask a few questions, but the rest of the stuff is pretty simple. You know, things like what's your O license? How many vehicles have you got? Things that um, I will be worried if you don't already know um, because they're pretty basic stuff. Um, so um, you can use the grant for um, buying equipment, so speakers, loops, display screens, that sort of thing, um, to make sure that the grant goes as far as possible. Um, we won't fund your um, surround sound 70 inch plasma 3D screen on bus. Um, we will, though, fund things that meet the minimum requirements. So, you know, a standard uh, set of speakers and amplifier for, for audio and a LED display, um, you know, because the minimum requirement is just to show uh, you know, the names, the text for destination and, and stop names and things like that. Now, you might decide, actually, we really want TFT because we can show things to you know visitors about attractions you know get off here for the zoo or you know the the museum or the beach or, or whatever um in which case um that's perfectly fine get a price for what you want get a price for uh, an led we'll fund the led um and you just top up to uh, to, to to get tft or whatever you want um we'll fund installation um as I alluded to, some of the major suppliers have got a bit of a um, installation engineer shortage. They've got plenty of kit. Um, so um, in some cases they're going, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort you out with the kit and we'll, uh, we'll help somebody do the installation, but we can't do it ourselves. Um, if you need um, tools to manage the data and the routes and keep them up to date, um, that's specific to um, the audiovisual requirement, then uh, we'll pay for that and we'll pay for the first year of maintenance as well. Um, as I say, the, the process is pretty simple. Um, you get a quote from a supplier. We're not requiring quotes from three suppliers um, because when we get the, uh, the 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 application in from yourselves. We're going to look at that quote, um, and um, we know what a sensible price is. If you come to us and say we got a quote from this supplier and it's going to cost us ten thousand pound a bus, we're going to go well. That's a bit out of kilter with uh, with the other applications that we've got for similar vehicles. So you know, have a think about another supplier because this one's uh, perhaps uh, overcharging. Um, so far, we've not seen that, by the way, in the applications that we've received. Um, everybody's being pretty sensible. And suppliers, unless you've got a very unusual vehicle, um, are turning around quotes in a day or two um, because uh, because they know what needs to be done and they will have seen pretty much every vehicle type by now. Um, then there's a uh, claim form. You know, simple things like where do you want us to send the money? How many vehicles have you got? And, and the sort of the basic stuff um, that you will know. Um, the reason you might need to ask an accountant is that this grant is classed as state aid under the state aid regulations. So we're asking you to fill out a subsidy self-certification form. 
So we need to know what other forms of state aid you might have had over the last three years, because what we can't do is give you this grant and that takes tips you over the state aid limits, um, because that will then uh, cause uh, both yourselves and ourselves uh, a load of problems. So we're uh, we're trying to avoid that by uh, making sure that we know what other uh, aid you've had um, and then there's some contract terms to agree um, we've tried to keep those as uh, as simple and fair as possible so things like um, you know, when you've got the kit if you get rid of a vehicle that the kit's on um, and you replace it well move it to the new vehicle um, or make sure your new vehicle's got kit on keep it operational for at least five years and we'll have a process where we uh, get you to provide evidence of that and we'll have somebody that's uh, going around doing spot checks to make sure that um, so uh, simple stuff hopefully um, uh, easy to uh, to deal with nobody's uh, said there's any problems with that so far anyway um, in terms of time scales um, there's not long left for the current closed date um, which is the 3rd of June um we are trying to extend that but with the general election having been called that might not be possible um so um do for the time being treat that as the as the deadline um and um we should get um decisions out on grant award in early july um we do need dft sign off on who's getting the grants so we do need the civil service to be operational um, for that um, and it's uh, not going to be over the next um, few weeks uh, making too many decisions unfortunately but by the time we've uh, we've got all the documentation together to them um, it should be okay um, and in terms of the process for allocation um, once we've got the bids in, we will start with the smallest operator. Um, so, you know, operators with bids in that have got a single vehicle and then, uh, you know, two vehicles and, and, and work up from there until we've uh, got rid of all the grant because we really do want to give this money away. Um, we can't hand it back, so we've got to get rid of it. Um, on the RT website, there's a whole set of pages um around the regulations uh quick guides as well as links to the full regulations if you want them um and uh all of the forms you need and link to the uh online application process for the uh for the grant um we've got dedicated email address um and the team will get back to you pretty quick normally within a few hours um, if you've got any questions or queries um, and phone numbers on the next slide. Um, if you want to know more about audio visual equipment, don't quite know what's available and things like that. We've got a report on the different technologies, um, things that you should be thinking about as you go into a project to uh, do the fitting you know what you, what you need to be planning for and, and thinking about how you might want to get user groups involved because one of the lessons from uh, implementations elsewhere is um, if you get some of your users involved in in testing and um, checking things then uh, then you know that goes down very well um, and gets them on site to start with. Um, so think about that and also um, what you need to think about with maintenance and things like that. Um, so uh, do download that and have a read of that as well. Um, and um, yeah, Arthur's phone number and my uh, email address um, if you want to get in contact. Um, has anybody got any questions about the grant and the process? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah, can. Um, I'm just looking at this. Some some of these vehicles, depending on age, you've got to come online from the 24th of October this year, um, some from October next year, and some from October 26. Do we need to be applying 
for grants for all the vehicles now, or will there be a separate run next year and a year after? No, this, no, is, this a, is a th this, this grant, grant is all that there is going to be. Right. I'm not I'm expecting not more money next year. So um, part of the reason for part of the reason originally for having the grant, as well as the you know the disproportionate the cost that issue was actually to get early fitment um mm. rather than leaving it to the last minute which is the temptation with all of these things okay okay thank you can i just ask a question on the state aid situation yeah i'm not a state aid expert but my understanding is that if you're offering it to everybody the state aid falls away Um, so the advice we've had from Treasury is that because it's not available to everybody, because it is a bit of, you know, if everybody, if we're not offering it to every operator, it's only the smallest. Therefore, it comes under state aid. If we were, f if the grant would fully fund every bus in England, Scotland and Wales, then that's not state aid. But because it's select, there's an element of selection. It is. Right. Yeah, get that, get that. And and how big is your pot? Uh, four and a half million. That goes quite a long way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Richard. Just, just yeah, just a couple of things for me. You know, it's not long, of course, until June from today's. You know, meeting, of course, but links have been sent out a while back just to pick up on the gentleman's point. Um, sorry, I, we don't know each other. But the gentleman in the blue jumper on the screen in front of me here now. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, picking on that point so in terms of forward planning, Tim, um, looking at along those kind of you know, the next years coming along. It's going to be really difficult because what, what I'm going to say is, is this you base it, I assume, on the fleet and the services you run today, because what's going to happen you know, in the next two, three, four years, you may have operators saying two years time, you know what, our service, it's no longer commercial, I'm going to withdraw from it. Or, you know, an operator will win successful bids, you know, tenders, which I'm assuming then would be reflected in the tender price, or they would lose contracts, of course. So a lot can change, can't it, in terms of you know, the various kind of fleet sizes. I know you, I'm sure you've had this already, you know, across the border, but it's going to be quite difficult to cut the plan ahead, isn't it? Um, well, so from a from a grant point of view, it's the services and fleet that you were operating on the 8th of April when the grant okay. launched. OK. Um, so uh, that was to overcome some interesting challenges that operators were threatening to do to to reduce <laughs> fleets and, um, and then increase them after they got the grant and things like that. But I mean, you're right, a lot will change over time. Um, and uh, these regulations need to become part of standard thinking and operation in the same way that PSVAR and um, you know the 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 bus open data service and the Welsh data service requirements you know have become um, and so you know then you know you just have to price that in um, but everybody will be doing that. I'm just thinking in terms of my previous as I said working hats having run a bus company having worked in a local authority a bus operator will be planning ahead thinking you know, potentially when am I going to be still coming out of COVID, travel trends have changed, costs are going up, you know, all these different things. Equally then for a local authority, they will need to factor in this cost into their procurement cycles. Mm. So, so we're in a position, if we're not careful, hopefully you know, vehicles will be kitted out. So it'll be those vehicles going around. And if there are new vehicles, then stipulated they come already of course with the equipment if i understand it right yeah so but it's 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 you know having working closely with local authorities as well you know they're strapped for cash without a doubt um 
and I think it's going to be this will put pressure on them for those vehicles in the middle ground. Um, but then equally for operators, it may kind of tip the balance on those marginally commercial services because just I'm just playing it out and shoot me down on this. When the money runs out and there's no more money, it's going to be difficult then for that operator to say, right, I'm going to be spending X thousand pounds. My service is no longer viable. There's that kind of tipping point. I'm not expecting you, of course, to come up with the answer. I'm just kind of, I'm saying the things that mm. probably operators on the call are thinking. There's that tipping point when the funds run out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the 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 the, the one off cost of, of of equipping a vehicle um, is not significant in the scale of okay. you know, new vehicle cost because we're looking at well you know and and a new vehicle factory fitted is probably going to cost you know about two and a half grand um, and that retrofitting might cost three. Um, so you know when it, against a you know half million pound new vehicle um you know that's not very much at all for an old vehicle um it is you know something that's a you know a sign- reasonably significant amount but ongoing maintenance of these you know, the, the kit tends not to go wrong very often and so maintenance costs are are pretty low um you know they're not 20 percent of new unlike you know some maintenance costs and things like that they're less than that normally um and so uh you know so it's not that much but as you say that might be enough to tip to tip the balance yeah i think these are the things we need to kind of flush out if mm. you know, if we get together to discuss and, and it, i'm sure some will smile as i say this on the call but it's the haggle factor so when you buy new vehicles you know we've all been there we've haggled with alexander dennis opted as they used to be called if you're buying two vehicles, you can haggle on paintwork and all that. It 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 depends on that scope of operation you've got and the haggle factor you've got to to to, to haggle that very point with the manufacturer. Mm, yeah, and you know, having talked to the big groups, I already know that in a few years' time, when they're getting rid of vehicles into the second-hand market. Um, mm-hmm. They're going to be leaving on the display, uh, leaving in the, the the audio system and the hearing loop. They're not going to bother to take that out. All they'll do is is take out the the computer. And so, you know, uh, you know, maybe five hundred quid gets you uh, gets you a working system at that point. But they're not going to be doing that for a couple of years because they want a bit of a return on their investment. Uh, you know, when they're installing it now, so. You know, a couple of years down the line, you start to see the benefit of that. But uh... that, that was going to be my very next question, actually, when when vehicles are cascaded from the larger groups and they become available in the second hand market, mm. they will include the equipment. But then we saw a similar situation, if you remember, when we moved from kind of the old roller blinds onto electronic blinds. There's different manufacturers out there. And that little brain computer we had, it varies from one manufacturer to the other so yeah. is, is is there something being thought of here in terms of future proofing when vehicles are cascaded you know a particular type of equipment on a particular vehicle if you buy that little computer you were talking about is it actually interchangeable then with with different kind of different systems so some suppliers is but you know, if you bought McKenna's or Hanover, then you need to be, you know, knocking on their door, at least at the moment. Um, yeah. uh, there are conversations about how do we standardise the interfaces for these, but uh, they'll take a little while to come through. Um, certainly, you know, TFL, when they're cascading, they will remove the displays um, because they do at the moment, um, but they leave the cabling in. Um, and most manufacturers you know can reuse that cabling most suppliers can reuse tfl cabling um, yeah. and that to be honest when you're retrofitting is the difficult bit that's why it takes a day to do the install because you've got to remove panels and uh, cut your fingers and <laughs> all of that sort of stuff when you're putting the cabling in the rest it's just of the it's practical things 
Yeah, it's just the. I'm just thinking if I was an operator again now, it's that you know if you if you're inheriting a vehicle which has been cascaded, and it has an all singing all dancing system on it where certain screens have been removed, and you're an operator in kind of deep rural Wales, and you don't have the patronage there to support a singing all dancing system, only a system that meets the requirements. It's just it's just taking it all into a into the round, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is so. There's a comment coming in from a. Is it a Luke? Do you, do you wanna? Do you wanna? Yeah. So uh, Moby Tech can link with Hanover displays, but Hanover a, AV cannot link with Moby Tech exterior displays. Yeah, I mean you get things like that. You get some suppliers that are happier to to work with other ones than 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 vice versa. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, that's just the way the commercial market is, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm just trying to think here in terms of future proofing because you have some services may be marginal out mm. there following mm. COVID and everything else. And it's just kind of trying to avoid that tipping point when an operator potentially will go, ah, do you know what? It's not worth doing that service because of it, it makes the situation worse than when, mm. you know, it's eroding what's out there, they're not improving. I'm just trying to think ahead mm. in terms of making sure around the unintended consequences and equally then protecting our operators here in Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? Please, anybody, if you've got any questions, please, just, there's no stupid question. I've asked plenty of them, so please ask away if you've got any questions. And if there are any further questions, as you say, Tim, you've provided a contact link. Yeah. Please don't be afraid to use it. Please send Tim a question. Mm. Mm. Anything else from anybody else? If, if not, then can I, can I just thank you very much, Tim, um, for following through with the request I made to set up a, a bespoke meeting here Pleasure. in Wales with, 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 with our Wales with our own valuable Wales operators, of course. Mm. Um, if there's anything else at a later point, not that I'm kind of pushing you into a corner on it, but I'm sure you'd be quite prepared to have a follow-up yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, 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 great, that's good to know. And then if we have, say, some kind of a working group set up in Wales to look at practicalities, et cetera, et cetera, I'm, I'm sure... You'd be yeah, I'm happy to get involved, involved and, and, and happy to, to get suppliers involved as well because, you know, they they will know some of what's possible and what's not and, and that sort of thing when we get to that point. So, yeah, yeah. OK, so that's yeah. a point. Everybody on the call, Tim, is about if, if you think of anything and we can have a further call to discuss anything, please shout out. Scott, I know you're still on the call. Ian from CPT, Colin. Please shout out if we can set something else then again as we progress, because I don't want it to be, Tim, just today, you know, presentation, that's it, go away. Yeah, we'd like to continue this kind of discussion with yourselves and DFT. Yeah. So we can just make sure it is deliverable, but equally we protect our operators here in Wales. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very fine. much, Tim, and thanks to everybody else for coming along as well. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.